Welcome to Trinity Episcopal Church. Um, my name is uh, Deborah Sovany. I am uh, the People's Warden, a title I'm a little bit ambivalent about, but, um, uh, <laughs> but um, uh, Trinity uh, Church has been part of Stoughton for um, over 125 years. Uh, we were initially located down Freeman Street. Uh, for the last four or five years, we've uh, shared our space with uh, Zion Baptist Church, uh, which has been a wonderful collaborative relationship. Um, the preschool that we have downstairs this year, we're going to be uh, celebrating our uh, 50th um, anniversary. So um, uh, we have a long history of educating generations of uh, uh, Stoughton's preschoolers. Uh, for myself, I taught Sunday school to high schoolers for uh, about 17 or 18 years. And around this time of year, uh, uh, we would always read together one of my favorite uh, pieces by uh, Dr. King, which is a letter from the Birmingham City Jail. And um, it was always kind of interesting and challenging because um, when you're working with teenagers and they would sort of focus on the fact that, well, Dr. King said that you have a moral responsibility to disobey unjust laws. And that was always, no, that doesn't mean because you're grounded that, that you know, that, that no, that you have to, you, you, you have to determine um, uh, what laws are just and what laws are unjust. And Dr. King, we would talk about that in class, about how he laid out um, what the criteria are for, for disobeying unjust laws. So that was always kind of an interesting, and one of my favorite parts of, of the whole year is uh, talking to the class about this. Um, but uh, so the long and short of it is, Welcome to Trinity Church and um, uh, our service or the uh, diversity committee service for uh, honoring Dr. King. My name is Deborah Roberts. I'm the co-chair for the Stoughton Diversity and Inclusion Organization. Steve Tapper, who's upstairs, <laughs> he's the other co-chair. The Stoughton Clergy Association and the Stoughton Diversity and Inclusion Organization welcome you to the celebration in honor of the legacy of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. 
Before I talk about today's program, I would like to acknowledge a couple of people. One is I saw Chairman of the Board of Selectmen, Bob O'Regan, in the back. I see, if you could raise your hand so everyone knows you, uh, Christine Howe. She is um, on the Board of Selectmen and one of our financial supporters. I saw Christine, she's in the front. I saw Joe Feaster. He is longtime Stoughton resident and one of our financial supporters. And also, we received a letter from Senator Elizabeth Warren, and I was asked to read that letter. She says, Dear friends, each year we honor the life of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. We come together to remember those who marched, sat in, voted, and changed the course of history. Today, America is facing old challenges and new. We have a bigger responsibility to act than ever before, to fight hard and make this government work for everyone. Dr. King taught us to speak out when we're told to be silent, to come forward when we're told we're not wanted, and that we have the power to change the rules if we work together. I'm proud to stand with you in the fight to close the Rachel wealth gap and build economic opportunity for all. We will resist, we will persist, and we will overcome. Sincerely, Elizabeth Warren, United States Senator. So thank you. Thank you everyone for attending. This morning we will enjoy a musical dedication to the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and hear student essay writing presentations. John Gunning is the Stoughton public school teacher and an executive board member for the Stoughton Diversity and Inclusion Organization. He'll provide more details about the students and the essay contest. We're happy to have Reverend Sarah Napoline as our keynote speaker. We want to thank her and her congregation for hosting this year's MLK program. The topic for today and the title of the student essay contest is what's your life's blueprint? What's your life's purpose? Reverend King always dreamed everyone is created equal regardless of race, sexual orientation, or religion. King believed in civil rights and community service work. This work is also important to the town of Stoughton. To provide a little detail about the Stoughton Diversity and Inclusion Organization, it was formed about two years ago. Our mission is to embrace, celebrate, and share our diversity. We celebrate the peaceful exchange of ideas from multiple perspectives. We've partnered with the Stoughton Clergy Association, which was founded over 10 years ago. Their purpose is to foster respect for and appreciation of the different religious traditions and their respective congregations in Stoughton, as well as to provide for greater cooperation and mutual understanding among Stoughton's congregations and clergy. We have shared values. This year, we collaborated with the Stoughton Youth Commission, Stoughton Public Schools, Old Colony YMCA, Stoughton Chamber of Commerce, and the Blue Hills NAACP branch to make this a community-based event. These partnership and collaborations are instrumental in making this event successful. Last year, Joseph Feaster, a past interim town manager, was our keynote speaker. He did a very good job providing us with historical background, and he answered the question, what would King say if he were here today? Last year, Reverend Rebecca indicated in the late 1950s, Gil Caldwell was the first African-American clergy person to serve at the United Methodist Church here in Stoughton. He went on to be a leader in the civil rights movement, working side by side with Reverend King. 
it's vital that we remember the importance of what the town of Stoughton leaders tell us as we move forward and continue to work together. We want to repeat the positive. Next month is our Black History Month, and we should continue to strive for a more accepting society. Looking ahead, we're optimistic the MLK program will be an annual event. In closing, my personal life's blueprint will be to see the town of Stoughton as a leader in cultural and economic diversity. Thank you very much. Enjoy today's program. Next year, hear a musical selection followed by John Gunning. Good morning. Shortly after our service last year, the committee began plans for this year's presentation. And the committee decided to seek out one of Dr. King's speeches that might appeal to young people. 
And the speech that we came upon is a speech that is titled, What is Your Life's Blueprint? Um, and, and some, within that speech, he incorporated elements of um, sometimes what has been referred to as Dr. King's uh, street sweeper um, uh, speech, in which he instructed uh, young people that uh, if your lot in life was to be a street sweeper, street, sweep streets the way that Michelangelo painted paintings. And so today, we would like to listen to Dr. King's words, what is your life's blueprint? And I will ask Megan Lurie. to come on up and read the speech. What is your life's blueprint? I want to ask you a question, and that is, what is your life's blueprint? Whenever a building is constructed, you usually have an architect who draws a blueprint, and that blueprint serves as the pattern, as the guide, and a building is not well erected without a good, solid blueprint. Now each of you is in the process of building the structure of your lives, and the question is whether you have a proper and solid and a sound blueprint. I want to suggest some of the things that should begin your life's blueprint. Number one in your life's blueprint should be a deep belief in your own dignity, your worth, and your somebodyness. Don't allow anybody to make you feel that you're nobody. Always feel that you count. Always feel that you have worth. And always feel that your life has ultimate significance. Secondly, in your life's blueprint, you must have as the basic principle the determination to achieve excellence in your various fields of endeavor. You're going to be deciding as the days, as the years unfold, what you will do in life, what your life's work will be. Set out to do it well. And I say to you, my young friends, doors are opening to you, doors of opportunities that were not open to your mothers and your fathers. And the great challenge facing you is to be ready to face these doors as they open. Ralph Waldo Emerson, the great essayist, said in a lecture in 1871, if a man can write a better book or preach a better sermon or make a better mousetrap than his neighbor, even if he builds his house in the woods, the world will make a beaten path to his door. This hasn't always been true, but it will become increasingly true. And so I would urge you to study hard, to burn the midnight oil. I would say to you, don't drop out of school. I understand all of the sociological reasons, but I urge you that in spite of your economic plight, in spite of the situation that you're forced to live in, stay in school. And when you discover what you will be in your life, set out to do it as if God Almighty called you at this particular moment in history to do it. Don't just set out to do a good job. Set out to do such a good job that the living, the dead, or the unborn couldn't do it any better. If it falls your lot to be a street sweeper, sweep the streets like Michelangelo painted pictures. Sweep streets like Beethoven composed music. Sweep streets like Leontine Price sings before the Metropolitan Opera. Sweep streets like Shakespeare wrote poetry. Sweep streets so well that all the hosts of heaven and earth will have to pause and say, here lived a great street sweeper who swept his job well. If you can't be a pine at the top of the hill, be a shrub in the valley. Be the best little shrub on the side of the hill. Be a bush if you can't be a tree. If you can't be a highway, just be a trail. If you can't be a sun, be a star. For it isn't by size that you win or fail. Be the best of whatever you are. Thank you, Megan. It is important for us today to understand the historical context in which Dr. King spoke those words. They were spoken on October 26, 1967, to a group of students at the Barrett Junior High School 
and Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And it is most significant that the first prong of Dr. King's three-pronged message is a belief in one's own dignity, one's own self-worth. He knew that the young people to whom he was speaking needed to hear that message loudly and clearly. Because without a belief in one's own dignity, there could be no blueprint. Doors are opening to you, doors of opportunities that were not open to your mothers and your fathers. For Dr. King, these young men and women would hopefully be the beneficiaries of the hard work and labor put forth by those who are involved in the long struggle for civil rights and human rights. More than a half century later, Students from Stoughton were asked to reflect upon the meaning of Dr. King's words with an eye towards applying his message to their lives and their times. Some of our writers expressed uncertainty about the exactness of their future plans, but they express ideas consistent with Dr. King's message. They wrote about the need to address institutionalized racism, sexism, LGBTQ rights, poverty, discrimination, inequality, the abuse of power, and the corrosive effect of stereotypes. As they speak, you can hear the influence of Dr. King in their writings. I want to help others who may not have the opportunities I have been given. I will hold true to my values, taking the metaphorical high road, valuing love, morality, moral uprightness. Another road, I will work to empower people, for empowering people is my purpose in this world. Yet another, I will help improve the community in which I live. I will work to identify the systematic flaws within the community. I will do my part to change it. And this, I will push equality for everybody. I want to build courage to stand up for my beliefs and morals. We as a human society should erase this idea that we are better than somebody else. Therefore, we get special privileges. My purpose is to help everybody reach, attain equality. My life has so much potential, I'm not letting that go to waste. No blueprint is perfect, nothing is perfect but I'll work hard to spread my purpose, saving the world from itself. Other students did write about specific plans for a career path, a math teacher, a fashion designer, a computer software engineer, a social worker, and again, each writer used Dr. King's message for guidance. You can hear it in the math teacher who says, I know I must believe in myself and I will surround myself with people who support my dream. Or the young middle school student who wishes to be a fashion designer making clothes that makes a statement but is affordable for all. I want to make clothing that is appropriate for every size, shape, and age. I wish to create something that helps people feel good on the inside and the outside. And this. Once I am successful in my business, I want to help others get a start and become successful as well. Can you hear Dr. King nodding his approval? I hope to get an education, become a software engineer, create things that will make people's days a little bit easier. And another student wrote, I wish to become a social worker. I want to help young kids who are struggling at home. And I want to help immigrant kids as they strive to make their dreams come true. 
As stated before, some students expressed uncertainty about the development of their group blueprint, but I would suggest to you today that through their efforts and their willingness to share their thoughts with this community, these students who are sitting over here have affirmed their dignity and self-worth and they stand ready to determine their field of endeavor and execute their plan. Let us recognize their accomplishment. Each of the awardees will receive a certificate and a monetary award in recognition of their efforts and their contributions. We would like to um, recognize the following for earning honorable mention for their work at the middle school level. And uh, Mrs. Teresa Tappa will uh, present certificates. Samaya Dixon. Samaya is. <laughs> Hannah Hauser. <laughs> Devin Aral. Earning, earning honorable mention for their work at the high school level, Alexia Baptista. <laughs> Jennifer Bradford. <laughs> Elizabeth Foley. Megan Murray. Sebastian Malik. Jordan Resurrection. Dean Rodriguez. There is a certificate and award that is given to the best entry in the middle school and the high school levels. And the best entry in the middle school level is awarded to Yosra Kadora. Yosra, would you like to come on down and share your thoughts that you wrote? Hi, I'm Yosra Kadura, and I just want to say thank you, first of all, for actually noticing my work. And I would like to read my thing. Honestly, my life's blueprint is still being drawn. As a young child, my future plans were always changing from doctor to princess to teacher to astronaut. However, most of what I dream just doesn't appeal to me as I grow older. Almost every day, I find myself asking, what is the meaning of life, or why do I want to grow up to be a, or is this really going to make me happy? I still don't know the answers to those questions, and I think I never will if I keep asking. To me, life is filled with positive mysteries and adventure but it's also filled with hatred and inequality. For a while, I actually have been questioning the human race because of the hatred and inequality. You probably can't go, you can't even go a day without turning on the news and hearing another hate crime or shooting has been committed. Our world is still divided because of our opinions on others, about what, whether LGBTQ is a sin or not, about which country is right or wrong, about which religion should be followed, about what people from diverse backgrounds can or can't do, 
Each and every day, our world worsens because of people's preference or inability to accept choices that they don't, un oh God, or inability to accept choices they don't agree with or understand. Many people want this to change, but are too afraid to take a stand because of how they will be seen or judged. I will, re I will regret saying this later, but I'm scared too. I'm just a 12-year-old girl whose opinion is invalid and overlooked by many. The only way I ever really knew I've ever really known to get people to listen is writing my work and spreading it anonymously. That's almost the exact reason why I'm writing this. Most people who read this won't even know who I am. That's why I'm not afraid to share my opinions here. Every day, humans are overlooking the fact that they are one in seven billion other humans, all basically the same, yet different. Each human is born with the ability to think, feel, speak for themselves, but with those pros comes many cons. Humans are gifted creatures. We all have many opportunities, yet many people waste those opportunities. We are all born with a mind, a body, a beating heart. We all have a life. A one life, one shot to make it count. To live a life of happiness, we need to spread happiness, true happiness. To give ha true happiness, a person has to find their self first. It's okay to have an opinion, but you can't tell a person how to live their life. Only they can decide. To do that, though, we, I need more than just myself. Every step I take is a step co closer to a happy life where everybody want, everyone feels accepted. My life has so much potential, and I'm not letting it go to waste. No blueprint is perfect. Nothing is perfect. But I'll work hard to spread my purpose, saving the world from itself. Thank you, Yosra. The certificate for best entry at the high school level is awarded to Jay Tyrell. My name is Jay Terrell, and I wrote a poem called What Will I Be? The blueprint of my life was decided the day I was born. It's a girl, the doctor celebrated, setting me up for a life I didn't want, setting me up for a life of disaster. Boys will be boys, girls will be girls. I'm two years old. Boys can chase each other around, play in the dirt, have fun. I, I have to sit inside, play dress up while the boys get to run. Let's play house. Girl stays, cooks, takes care of the kids. Boy leaves, provides for the family, and doesn't see them at all. But hey, boys will be boys, and girls will be girls. I'm four. That boy pushed me over because he likes me. That's what they all say. I learned that abuse means love, and that someone else hurting me is my fault, not their own. Boys will be boys, and girls will be girls. I'm six years old now. The boys run around with their shirts off in the summer. I stay covered up in a dress because we don't want the boys to stare. Being born as a girl was being born to be sexualized. Boys will be boys and girls start to hate being girls. I am eight, so close to double digits. I want to be an astronaut, the president, and a doctor. I'm quickly told no, I can't do those things. Besides being told that I can do whatever I want when I grow up. I should be a nurse or a teacher or a mom. Those are boys' jobs. The sexism starts young. Boys will be boss, girls will be grateful. I'm 10, starting middle school. I get dress coded for wearing a shirt that shows off my shoulders, while meanwhile, the boy behind me's pants are sagging near his ankles. I get in trouble for being distracting while it is 100 degrees out with no central air. Boys will be leaders, girls will be obedient. I'm 12 and I'm a feminist. I hold my head high while in gym I'm told I throw like a girl. I learned that I don't have a choice but to stand up for myself, because if I don't, no one will. A tear in the blueprint starts to form. Boys will be boys, girls will not be silent. I'm 14, and I'm not a girl. I'm a person who doesn't want a label for something so inconsequential. But society says I have to be labeled or I have to leave. 
The boys yell slurs while the girls point and laugh. Everyone turns on me. Boys will be boys, girls will be girls. What will I be? I'm 16 and I've been hospitalized six times. Mental health is not a real concern and nothing's wrong with me if you can't see it, right? I start to learn the truth to life. Boys will be, girls will be, I will be. I'm 18. I've experienced over 250 school shootings in my lifetime. I become desensitized to the fact that kids my age will get murdered in a supposedly safe place. Yet gun control does not seem to be an issue to politicians. If boys will be boys and girls will be girls, then why is that an explanation for their actions? If only girls are victims, then explain to me the 14-year-old boy I met who had been molested all his life. If being gay is wrong, then tell me why there are millions of kids all over the world just loving each other. If mental health isn't an issue, explain the 800,000 people who die from suicide every single year. If removing cells from a uterus is murder, why isn't the government trying to save the hundreds of kids being murdered in government-mandated schools? Boys will be boys is not an excuse for sexual harassment. Girls will be girls is not an excuse for hate speech and intolerance. And nothing is an excuse for the gunning down of innocent kids. The blueprint of my life is not one at all. It is a sheet covering the dark truth of humanity that I will tear down and show the world. My purpose in life is to change the world. I will destroy this blueprint to show that I do not have to be confined to a piece of paper. I have a voice and I will use it. And in the end, boys will be themselves and girls will be free and everyone will be equal. Thank you, Jai. To our students, we wish to thank you for participating in this event. We wish to thank you for your thoughts, your reflections on Dr. King, his message, and the relevance of his message to your world today. And thank you to everybody here, to the young students with us here today. This is your community. This is your support system. These are the folks who will help you on your way to developing, making your blueprint, and executing it. Thank you all so very much. I want to start by thanking the Stoughton Clergy Association and the Stoughton Diversity and Inclusion Organization for inviting me to speak to all the sponsors and supporters of this event and to everyone who braved the winter weather today. It is an honor to be here.
We are here today to remember a great leader and activist and to honor his memory as a prophetic voice for justice. We're taking this moment as an opportunity to re revise the blueprint of our lives. So, what needs changing? What plans did you make that are no longer relevant? What plans have been neglected that you must complete? What beautiful future needs a stronger foundation? You are a star of inspiration. It is your responsibility to build a brighter tomorrow. So how are you going to shine? There's an old Yiddish proverb, man plans and God laughs. But any God who laughs at man's plans clearly hasn't met a senior technical architect. You see, my father is a senior architect overseeing technical quality reviews for design and construction. He has over 50 years of experience. He's worked on over a billion dollars worth of heavy construction, and he's a nationally recognized expert on weather-resistant building enclosures. My father spends hours at a drafting board poring over blueprints, just like the ones Dr. King spoke about. He writes notes and questions, leaving a sea of post-it notes in his wake. My father specializes in building enclosure, which is, in other words, how to make the outer structure of a building do what it needs to do to keep moisture out and keep heat in, things we are appreciative of today. He's the type of technical quality control specialist who tries the patience of almost every designer he encounters. He marks up every flaw, every hiccup, every tiny part of a blueprint that could cause problems. Fellow architects create beautiful, interesting designs, but if there are structural flaws, oh no, my father disassembles their creative dreams with one stroke of his pen. His precision is infuriating and his confidence unshakable. And as much as designers and contractors get frustrated with him, He's a sought after expert in his field because of his tenacity, because he is right. He's passionate and dedicated and stubborn as all get out. He is called to be the best technical architect he can be and every day he works to achieve excellence. My father was fascinated with buildings and design when he was growing up, but as the eldest son in a big Irish Catholic family, his life's blueprint originally pointed him directly towards the priesthood. Luckily for my older brother and I, that didn't pan out. Instead, he was able to follow his curiosity and passion for design and became a certified architect. When his colleagues give him drawings of their beautiful and ambitious designs, he tells them, what will cause problems, what won't work at all, and what needs to change. It is up to the designers to take those suggestions, reflect on their larger goal in mind, and adapt their blueprint as needed. Today we heard an abridged portion of Dr. King's blueprint speech. In the full version, Dr. King outlines three clear suggestions for what should be added to your life's blueprint. First, a deep belief in your own dignity, your own worth, and your own somebodiness. Second, the determination to achieve excellence in your various fields of endeavor. And third, a commitment to the eternal principles of beauty, love, and justice. These components are universal throughout the world and throughout our lives. No matter who you are, no matter what dream you are chasing, no matter how much our blueprints change and evolve, these are the core principles that can help guide and inspire us. Dr. King told the students at Barrett Junior High School, this is the most important and crucial period of your lives for what you do now will determine, will decide what your, which way your life will go. Dr. King's address gave them suggestions for what to include in their life's blueprint the plan and guide that they can use to build their future, but the blueprint itself must be adaptable. Though it, it is a crucial moment, adolescence is only the very beginning of the life that we build and guide with our own choices and actions. It's the tipping point 
the moment when our agency is ignited. But over time, our lives will stray from our original blueprint. I know mine has, has yours. Anybody? Yes? No? Come on, yes, absolutely. The blueprint will come back from our mentors and our friends and our experiences with notes and comments, just like the post-it notes that my father sticks to the drawings at his office. It is through our ability to adapt that we can fully integrate and incorporate Dr. King's wisdom as we continue to envision and build our lives. The success of the blueprints begins with the integration of that first component, a deep belief in your own dignity and your own worth. Unitarian Universalism is a religious movement that does not have a creed statement, a central creed or faith statement. Our congregations are spiritually diverse communities of people sharing the journey of faith that we are, and we are united around our shared values and common purpose. Unitarian Universalist congregations throughout the nation affirm and promote certain principles that we lift up as moral truths. And the first one, the very first one, is the inherent worth and dignity of every human being. This is at the core of our theology about the world, about ourselves, and about all of humanity, that each and every person is worthy of life and love, that each and every person is worthy of basic human dignity and respect. Dr. King said, every person's blueprint needs a deep belief in your own dignity, your own worth and somebodyness. He says, don't allow anybody to make you feel that you are nobody. Always feel that you count. Always feel that you have worth and always feel that your life has ultimate significance. I hope that each and every teenager at Barrett Junior High heard those words and took them to heart. And I hope every teenager here today hears them with just as much clarity. Build a deep belief in your own dignity, your own worth and somebodyness. Always, always feel that you have worth, that your life has ultimate significance. But those words are just as true for someone who is 16 or 46 or 66 or 86. Always feel that you count. Always feel that your life has ultimate significance. Too quickly, we forget the wide-eyed wonder of childhood, the radical assurance and confidence that tells the world that we matter. Suddenly, somehow, we are consumed by doubt, self-conscious of the judgment of others and crushed by the pressure of societal expectations. We have forgotten this truth, this deeper truth that remains even when we don't see it, a truth that will eventually save us from ourselves, that no matter what, we each have inherent worth and dignity. Dr. King directed us to include it in our life's blueprint, and if it has been lost, we must do all that we can to recover it. Once we have discovered a deep belief in our own dignity, worth, and somebodyness, we must have the determination to achieve excellence in our various fields of endeavor. Integrity is when our words, our deeds, and our beliefs are fully united aligned, undivided. If our integrity is rooted in a place of dignity and self-respect, it doesn't matter what we do or how our lives turn out because we lived lives of integrity and dignity. No matter what you are called to be, a doctor, a lawyer, a school teacher, a preacher, a barber or beautician, a skilled laborer, Wherever our decisions lead us, whatever our life's work, we must do that work with dedication and respect. Dr. King says, if it falls to your lot to be a street sweeper, sweep streets like Michelangelo painted pictures. Sweep streets so that all the hosts of heaven and earth will have to pause and say, here lived a great street sweeper who swept his job well. There is no job beneath human dignity. No job that removes our inherent worth, our deep belief in our own inherent worth, can give us our human dignity, our connection to that inherent worth, and our human dignity reminds us that our life has ultimate significance, no matter our job title or our pay scale. Dr. King offered one final suggestion. He says that in your life's blueprint, there must be a commitment to the eternal principles of beauty, love, and justice. 
Don't allow anybody to pull you so low as to make you hate them. Don't allow anybody to cause you to lose your self-respect to the point that you do not struggle for justice. Our inherent worth is not tied to any action, any job, any choice, any blueprint. There is no blueprint that is beneath our dignity and no job that de denies our ultimate significance except for any blueprint that disregards this commitment to the values of beauty, love, and justice. The dignity and self-respect of the street sweeper lies in all our hands. We cannot dismiss the hard work of any person, the work of street sweepers, artists and caretakers, writers, activists and fast food line cooks, teachers, musicians and mechanics, entrepreneurs and dreamers and thinkers. All of it is valid and good and worthy of respect. Our human dignity is a core belief and a core need. Our dignity is connected to our integrity. Our dignity is found when we are integrated whole in ourselves. It's being allowed to make choices that are fulfilling and authentic and sustaining. Our self-respect comes from this for ourselves, but also from a world that values or devalues our role. We can strive to transcend that culture, to value ourselves no matter what, but more importantly, we should strive to change that culture to transform it, to demolish structures of hierarchy and oppression and classism. Dr. King said, however young you are, you have a responsibility to seek to make your nation a better nation in which to live. You have a responsibility to seek to make life better for everybody, and so you must be involved in the struggle for freedom and justice. Humanity's inherent worth and dignity and self-respect is the foundation for human harmony and all human thriving. Throughout all of this is a deep need for our own integrity. Our worth is there. Our dignity can be seized or discovered. Our self-respect can be cultivated. But without integrity, that sense of unification and integration, they are all off balance and hollow. Integrate our worth, our dignity, our self-respect, our dreams, our blueprint, our changing, growing blueprint. And that's where we become a star, if not a sun. You don't need to be rich or famous or powerful to change the world. You don't need to be a politician or a prophet or a king. We have everything we need. The blueprints of our lives, the guideposts and measurements that we've laid out. We have our inherent worth and dignity, which is tied to our bones, which is rooted in our very soul. We carry with us the awareness that no matter what, our lives hold ultimate significance. We are determined to achieve excellence, whether we are a superhero or a street sweeper. And we have our strong, unshakable commitment to the eternal principles, not temporary eternal principles of beauty, love, and justice. The author and spiritualist Marianne Williamson writes, our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate, our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our dark, that frightens us. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, talented, gorgeous? Actually, who are you not to be? You are a child of God, your playing small does not serve the world. There is nothing enlightened about shrinking so that other people won't feel insecure around you. We are all meant to shine as children do. We were born to make manifest the glory of God that is within us. It's not in some of us, it's in everyone. And as we let our own light shine, we unconsciously give other people permission to do the same. As we are liberated from our own fear, we, our presence automatically liberates others. Friends, what is there to be afraid of? We are indeed powerful beyond measure and we must keep going. The blueprints we have created will guide us toward bright tomorrows of justice and humanity. We are meant to shine as children do and when we let our own light shine, we give other people permission to do the same. If we can't fly, we'll run or walk, or crawl, but by all means, we will keep moving. 
No matter how new our blueprint is, or how, how much it has changed over the decades, we take up our shared responsibility to seek to make this nation a better place and continue the struggle for freedom and for justice and for love, beauty, and hope. Thank you. In the words of Reverend Dr. King, darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. And this morning, we have an opportunity to show our love for those around us in tangible ways through our donations to the Stoughton Food Pantries. And last year, after this service, we were able to offer each one of them a very generous check. And it is my hope and prayer that we'll be able to do the same today. Thank you for your generosity.
I would like to share with you now a prayer and the words of Martin Luther King Jr. Would you please bow your heads and close your eyes? Eternal God, out of whose mind came the great cosmic universe, we bless you. Help us to seek that which is high, noble, and good. Help us in the moment of difficult decision. Help us to work with renewed vigor for a warless world, a better distribution of wealth, and a brother and sisterhood that transcend race or color. Grant that we love you with all of our hearts, souls, and minds, and love our neighbors as we love ourselves, even our enemy neighbors. And we ask you, God, in these days of emotional tension, when the problems of the walls are gigantic in extent and chaotic in detail, to be with us and are going out and are coming in and are rising up and we are lying down in our moments of joy and our moments of sorrow until the day when there shall be no sunset and no dawn. Amen.
I uh, would just like to uh, thank uh, Senator uh, Walter Timothy, would you just, uh, who is here present, as well as um, Ted Phillips, legislative aide to uh, Representative Lou Kafka. Thank you for coming. And before I give the blessing, I'd like to invite the members of the Stoughton Clergy Association to come forward and the members of the Stoughton Com Committee for Diversity and, and Inclusion. Please come stand with me. And now, with the voice of a prophet, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King said, with faith, we will be able to go on to carve a tower of hope on the mountain of despair and bring into being that great dream and create right here in America a nation where all will live together and respect the dignity and worth of the human personality. And in a year when our mountain of despair seems to have grown higher rather than lower. Let us pray that we will yet carve that tower of hope as we respond to our own life's blueprint. And let us pray, like Dr. King, that you and I might be possessed by righteousness until that day comes when righteousness reigns supreme. And now may the Holy One bless us and keep us, illumine our path, guide our hands, and strengthen our will this day and always. And let us all go in peace. Amen.